It's time for Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Join us as we study the uncompromised Word of God and how it can be applied to our everyday lives. I want to start off this morning with a testimony, if I can. And I was given permission to say who it is, right? Okay, good, since I just looked at you and you nodded. You remember a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about the mind. And it was kind of odd for me to do, but I felt like I was supposed to have a couple of the guys go around and anoint people with oil that stood up that were having an above-normal struggle with the mind, a stronghold, a difficult uh, time that was more than just trouble at work or trouble at school, or a battle for their sanity, for their mind. And I think it was actually Ken Lankford and uh, Dylan that went around and, and did that. And from that came several testimonies, but this one I have permission to give. The moment depression crept into my life, I was pulling out of my driveway on my way to Pennsylvania to work on a pipeline. I remember looking back at the driveway as my pregnant wife was waving at me as I left. It would be a month before I would see her again, but the whole time my mind was being attacked over and over. I would read the word, listen to teaching, and feel better. As long as we were together, I thought I was happy, but it was just masking the depression I felt. By the time our first child was born, a beautiful, healthy baby girl, the joy I felt holding her, words could never describe. I was happy again until I had to leave for the next job. I would be gone two to three two weeks to two months at a time. The stress of working and being alone at night in a motel room or in my camper was starting to break me down piece by piece. I started to shut out everyone, but I didn't know why I was feeling this way. I'd get angry over nothing, then I would want to just break down and cry. I decided I needed help, and everyone I talked to basically told me to suck it up, or that's life. But it didn't feel right. We have to be careful how we approach people. How could feeling so terrible all the time be life? I would pray and read my Bible, but my faith was not where it needed to be. I thought maybe I needed to go see my doctor, but even that made me feel weird like they were judging me. They put me on some medicine to help me out. Then we found out my wife was pregnant again with twins. Well, this would give it away, wouldn't it? We were both shocked and happy, but then the thought of me being gone all the time made the depression worse. I felt extremely stressed and more emotional. It was like a dark blanket had been pulled over me, like I was suffocating. So I went back to the doctor, changed my meds, upped the dose, still nothing helped. I was working in Cleveland, Ohio and moving up quickly in the company. I then found a job where the office was based out of Russellville. I still had to travel but not as far. So I loaded up and came home thinking, yes, this is going to stop the depression. Wrong. I went back to the doctor, changed my meds with a higher dose again. The depression by this time was really affecting my marriage, and we would fight all the time. We were both stressed out. She was raising our three girls by herself, plus she was pregnant with our fourth child. Back to the doctor I went, changed my meds again. Soon after, I lost that job and came home to find work making less than half of my normal wages. But I was home with my wife and four girls every day. The stress of not making the money we were used to making really affected me. I sold my truck, I started selling off stuff I had bought to help us pay the bills and to get caught up. The depression was at a point I couldn't take much more. When my wife and I fought, I thought it was the, I was the worst husband and father in the world. I was a failure, a loser, and I felt like there was no one I could talk to about it, what I was going through. Every time I tried, I felt like they were making fun of me or telling me to grow up. So back to the doctor I went to change my medic medication once again, and they put me on a power bar and suggested therapy. I tried the meds, but they didn't help at this point. I felt like I was going to be like this forever. Then I realized I haven't been using my faith. I was tired mentally, emotionally, and physically. It was hard to fake a smile and pretend I was happy anymore. I was ashamed of myself as a Christian. It was Sunday morning, Susan was teaching on the mind. I remember thinking, this is for me. Wow, this is for me. <laughs> Then Susan called for those that have been battling with their mind to stand up and to be anointed. I stood, and I felt delivered immediately. 
There was well over a month ago, and I haven't had any medicine, depression, or stress since that morning. My anger issues are gone. I was delivered. Depression is an attack on your mind from the enemy that will destroy you if you let it. Stand in faith, resist the devil, and he will flee. I've overcome a lot of things in life. The death of my mother, the death of my best friend, addiction, fear, but depression was the hardest one because I was trying to do it on my own. I was leaving out the most important person in all of our lives, our father. When I let him in, I took down my wall of trying to fix it on my own. It was gone instantly. Don't give up. Don't give in to the enemy's tricks and deceptions. It's all a lie. Then he ends with scripture, 1 Peter says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Thank you, Dustin. <clears throat> I appreciate Dustin being willing to let me share that because depression is one of the toughest things I've found to minister to. Because when the mind's not thinking right, how do you deal with the mind? And so it's important to remember that the anointing breaks the yoke. And uh, we don't have to figure out how it's going to work. We receive. And uh, Dustin has told me if anybody's battling that kind of battle and we need him, he'll come into the office and he'll sit with us, sit with you, and uh, help you listen from a heart that understands. Amen? Praise God. That's good stuff. What time is it? Well, not right now. Not, not, not by the watch. That's the title. What time is it? What age are we living in? Y'all are all fixing to answer. You're all getting out your cell phones, hitting the button, aren't you? Or your Fitbits, you fit people. Hebrews 11, 7. The Hall of Fame of Faith, as we call it. I'm reading out of the NIV. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. I love this scripture. I love this scripture because it tells us that when a season is coming, God sends us a warning. We're his children. We warn our kids when we see something coming, don't we? We don't touch that, it's hot. Don't go out with them. That will get you in trouble. We give warning out of love. The scriptures that we're going to start reading this morning, we did a study on this. I got to look and it was, it was in 2015. I don't know where the last two years went because I was thinking, God, I just taught this. It's been two years ago. Uh, but it's important for us to realize the time we're living in and how we need to be prepared for this time. God warned Noah so that he could build an ark and save his household. That's what we're going to start doing this morning when we see the, the, the signs of the times that when we may go on several weeks with different scriptures of signs of the times. But this one tells us the characteristics of society during the final days. And I, what I want to know is, where am I at? What time am I living in? If this is the time I'm living in, how do I, how do I as a family... As an individual and as a family, how do I survive this time? How do I build my ark? How do I prepare something that will hold my family through this time? So that's kind of where we're going to go. Egypt was warned that famine was coming. God sent it through a dream to Pharaoh interpreted by Joseph. He warned them of the famine. Joseph was anointed. The persecution of the Jews was being revealed from Haman. Uh, he was going to kill the Jews. It was revealed Esther was anointed. The Gentiles were warned by God. Paul was anointed to go to the Gentiles. The sinners were warned by God. Jesus was anointed to come for the sinners. The world is warned in the scripture we're going to read today. You are anointed. In the words of Mordecai from when he was speaking to Esther... Who knows? Perhaps you were brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. So when we read these scriptures, we're not reading them out of fear. We're reading them to realize 
God has appointed us in this time, in this season. We need to know what time it is. So we, know, we need to know how to prepare ourselves with the word, how to prepare our families with the word, not just to protect us from what's happening, but so that we can be a light in that darkness. We don't, we gotta stop looking like the world. I mean, scripture's pretty plain. He says, come out from among them. <laughs> be sanctified, set apart, consecrated uh, for God. So we're going to get some good keys, and we're only going to cover part of them. When we covered this two years ago, we went through four sessions, four hours of teaching on it. We're not going to go that in depth today. I have one set of DVDs and one set of CDs left from that that are back on the sign-in table by the kiosk. They're free. There's a DVD set, it'll say in the corner, if it's a DVD. And there's a, if you want further teaching, if you're raising children or if you're a teacher and you want further teaching, the, I guess the teachers got up and went to children's church, didn't they? Teachers, we're good? Okay, they're getting prayed over this morning. We need to know this as leaders of young people. We need to know the signs of the time. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you want those DVDs or CDs, they're free. Just go back there and grab them. You'll get a little more in-depth study on it. We actually give the Greek words. All that kind of good stuff. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I got a lot of the, the meanings of these words uh, from the Greek scholar Rick Renner. So I'll try not to say that every time I give a definition. Just know. If there's a Greek meaning, I got it from a combination of Strong's, Vines, and from the Greek scholar Rick Renner. All right, 2 Timothy 3, 1. This no. Well, oh, we can just stop right there. This is an emphatic statement. You better know this. This is what you must know. This is certain. What he's fixing to tell us is a fact, and we better know it. This is something that he wants us to know. I mean, when he warned Noah, he told him because he wanted him to know. So he could pray, pray, I mean, prepare. He said, this know also, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now this last days, when you hear those phrases, it brings you back, or it does to me, to, to other scripture. Where he talks about uh, the prophet Joel is speaking and he's talking about in the last days and he says your sons and your daughters will prophesy you remember that one the so other scriptures where this last days is, is used but it's a different word and it means something different it's kind of like the last season but when he uses last days here it means the last of the last the final it's like if you were talking about this is August Frank you would be talking about the last day of August if you said the final days of August. Not the week, the final week of August. You'd be talking about the last day of August. And that's what he's saying here in the final days, the ultimate end, the last days. Perilous times. You know, we don't, we don't like to read this. I'm sure Noah didn't want to hear it's going to rain, and there's going to be a flood, and everything's going to be destroyed. Build an ark. But just because we live in a society that doesn't want to hear, doesn't mean we don't need to know. If I need to know something, whether I want to hear it or not, tell me. If I'm about to walk off a cliff, and I'm having a merry time on my walk, don't think, oh, she's having a great time, leave her alone. Stop me. <laughs> Stop me. Say something. God is saying something. He's, he's given warning. Perilous times. Oh, this word perilous. I don't want to hear it. I'm on my happy walk. But he says perilous times, exceedingly fierce times. Dangerous times. Risky times. Harsh times. And then the word barbaric. What time is it? I mean, what do you do to see what time it is? You look at the conditions around you if you don't have a clock. We can look at the conditions that he's going to list in the scripture and we can tell what time it is. 
And he says, when you see these things, it's perilous times, it's barbaric times, it's dangerous times, it's exceedingly fierce times, but he's not telling us that to scare us. He's telling us that so we can go into it prepared and anointed. Prepared and anointed. And light. Not scared and intimidated. So please keep that in mind as we read them. Then he starts giving the conditions of society. He's giving us a clock. And he's saying, this is how you can tell what time it is. This is how you can tell when you're in the final days. And we'll look at some other scriptures in weeks to come. The first thing he lists is, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. It's, that's what my clock reads. In, in, in the society that I live in, that's what my clock reads. And you could say, well, that's pretty well always been. It's never been like it is right now. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. I love what Rick Renner calls this generation. The I am generation. Do you remember when God was talking to Moses and Moses said, who am I going to say? What am I going to say to Pharaoh? Who am I going to say sent me? And he said, I am sent you. Well, this generation is a self I am generation. They basically will be their own gods. They want to be their own gods. Well, I know the scripture says, but. They want to set their own rules. They want to set their own goals. They want to do things their own way. They are the I am generation. They want to be their own gods. Now, how do we deal with that? As a church, as parents, as leaders, how do we protect our young people from being part of the I am generation? Because you know, as well as I do, not just in teenagers, not just in children, but in adults, it's hard to be different. And we can blame that on peer pressure on kids all day long, but you try being the different one on the workplace. So how do we keep from being a part of this I am generation? How do we recognize it? And what do we do about it? Mark chapter 12, Jesus is speaking. And, and what I love about this passage from Jesus is that really you can defeat any of society's wrong characteristics with this passage. If we can get this passage through to our children, if we can get this passage through to ourselves, we'll keep out all the other characteristics that society will have in the last days. Jesus said, the first of all commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, and you will love the Lord your God with all of your soul, and you will love the Lord your God with all your mind, and you will love the Lord your God with all your strength, this is the first commandment. Why is it the first commandment? You can't do any of the others if you don't love God. You won't get through this perilous times if you don't have this established. He is one Lord. He is one God. You can't be God and Him be God. You can't be an I am. You have to love the I am. You have to love Him. I don't know how much the first commandment is, is taught anymore. The second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. This is the greatest thing we can get through. This will change everything and how we do things, how we see things, how we say things. You know, we can look at the I am generation. We can look at men being lovers of selves rather than lovers of God and we can see it I mean you can you can watch a commercial and see it you can watch TV shows and see it you can listen to music and you can see it you can go to school and you can see it you can go to work and you can see it but what I want us to do is look in the doors of our home and say can I see that because left alone this is the way we will go if we don't force the God principle, we don't make a determination in ourselves and teach a determination in our children 
to put God first and to not be our own gods, that's the way we will naturally go. So in your home, inside your doors, in your car, in your school, at your work, are you seeing this in yourself? Are you battling this? Influence has to start with me. When, you know, we complain about the world. I, I've, I've done it. Complain about how they are. We can see this thing in other people and we can say, oh, they're just selfish. They're so selfish. Well, I'm the influence. <laughs> I am the influence. What's my, what's my influence on this generation, on this time? What am I doing to battle being lovers of our own selves? Do we let that self-love cross the line into pleasing ourselves above pleasing God? I mean, my goodness, it's, it's just hard to get people to pray or to go to church or to spend time with their families. That's where we are on the clock. Because so many other things are more important than what's important to God. Have we let self-love cross the line to where we're pleasing ourselves above pleasing God? Tough questions. We've got to have an answer. Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, and with all of our mind. That's what we've got to keep in front of us. The second thing he lists is covetous. It literally means love of silver, love of money, love of money. Lee talked about it up here today, taking the offering. It's the love of money. If you trust in riches, he read. If you trust in riches. And this is hard not to do. It's hard not to trust. And, and sometimes we see being driven as being successful. Well, it depends on what it's driving you to. Depends on what it's driving you to. And it depends on what it's driving you away from. Where is it taking you? What's it taking you from? We live in a society that never gets enough. And that's really what that word means. Never satisfied. Never satisfied. Always desiring. Never enough. And totally consumed with their own comforts. Just wanting more and more and more. Now, we say they, this society out there, but do we know how to be satisfied? Are you satisfied? That doesn't mean that you don't, in your businesses, go to achieve more. But are you happy? Are you satisfied? What are you driven to? Why are you driven? What are you driven from? It's okay to be achievers. Just better know what you're achieving. Why? Is it for your family? So you can give more to the kingdom? It's so you can help other people? I don't know if you're like me, but when you started out, some of you that are my age-ish, when you started out, you kept a certain amount in your checking account that you felt comfortable with. We laugh about this all the time because I'll tell Rusty, you know, slow down. Slow down. We've got to slow down on the spending, you know, and, and he'll say, how much have we got in the bank account or whatever, and then we'll just start cracking up because it's more money than we could have dreamed of having when we were this age. But we're not comfortable with that amount anymore. Now we've got to have more, and we have less debt. We have no debt. So it's, there's something driving inside of us in the flesh that's like, that's not enough. We've got to get more. We've got to get more. And that's when we go over into that trusting in riches. riches. Who is our provider? Who is our provider? Jehovah Jireh, the one who sees and provides. But when we move over, and you'll find as we go through these things, that, that these accumulate on top of each other. And when we start seeing ourselves as our own provider, we've already seen ourselves as I am. I am my provider. 
I am my provider. And when we are our provider, then we have to accumulate more and more and more. Do your children know how to be satisfied? Not if we don't teach them. Because by nature, they do not. So we have to, be teach, we have to teach them how to be satisfied. Braden the other day, he, he's really into Thomas. Thanks, Stacy. It's due to the DVDs you gave me. He's into Thomas the Train. And so, you know, he knows when we go to Walmart. I'm taking him to the grocery store with me the other day, and he said, I said, we're going to go, the, you want to go to the grocery store with? No, yes. So we're, we're walking in. He realizes we're at Walmart and not Kroger. And he goes, this is where the toys are. I was like, well, they're on that side of the store, and we're going to that side of the store. Because I thought right then, now most of the time, you know, he gets something. But there are times he doesn't. Why? Not because I can't buy it for him. Not because I don't want to buy it for him. But because he needs to know how to be satisfied. And he'll get out the back of that Thomas the Train, the little mini ones package, and he'll, he'll line up the ones that he has, and he'll say, we need that one. He just turned three. Now this is going to be a 16-year-old someday. This is going to be a 21-year-old day someday. This is going to be a 40-year-old man someday. And his parents are doing a great job, thank God, the Lord, his parents are doing a good job at teaching him how to be satisfied. Because a fit is not thrown when we don't go. If a fit is thrown, then it just has to be thrown. Because once you say no, you have to stick to it. Or, or you're teaching them something you don't want to teach them. And we have way too many 40-year-olds throwing fits because they're not getting. And they're not satisfied if they're not getting. Getting will never satisfy us. He never will. Was it the Apostle Paul that said, I know how to be? I know how to have plenty. I know how to be in want. I know how to be. Why? Because it's God that supplies his needs. And that's how we combat that in ourselves. But we've got to ask ourselves the question, do we, does our household, know how to be satisfied? Hebrews 13, 5 says keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said never will I leave you never will I forsake you we're not going to want we're not going to want for any good thing the scripture plainly tells us that I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging bread now when we believe that we put the I am in the right place but when the I am is me, there's going to be a craving for money that cannot be satisfied because we want that security. Money is a source of security. Or we think it is, but it's just really not. The more money people have, the more scared they are of losing it. Truth. Can we give? Can we give? That's another way I can find out where I am. Can I give? Can our children give? <laughs> Cleaning out the toy box can be a challenge, right? Going through your things, saying you don't play with this anymore. Oh, but yes, I do. I was going to. I thought about it the other day. You haven't touched that in a year. That's for ages three to five and you're 10. I'm going to give this to so-and-so. Oh, no. No, don't, don't give that away. I, I'm, I'm still going to play with that. Well, we're 40-year-olds. Well, I'm 50-year-olds doing that. Hoarders. I mean, just keep it. Just keep it, just in case we need it. Leave him alone. <laughs> we need his stuff. We know if we need to borrow anything, he's like Leonard's hardware. It, he's got it. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God will never leave you and he'll never forsake you. What you're thinking is security. It is not your security. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency and with the first fruits of all your income. 
so shall your storage places be filled with plenty and your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. Can you give? Can your children give? You know, if you follow your money trail, you'll find your heart. People talk about following the paper trail. Follow the paper trail. Follow the money trail. You follow your money trail, you'll find out where your heart is. All right, covetous. We're not going to be covetous. We're going to be able to be satisfied where we are, knowing that God is our source. He is the I am over our money. Number three, third thing he lists, boasters. This was kind of different than what my mind thought it was. That's why it's so good to look these words up because what our society now, this generation, thinks a word is could be totally, have y'all learned that? There's certain words you don't use anymore because they don't mean the same thing. Talk to Bob if, if your kids laugh every time you say something and he'll explain to you why. It doesn't mean what it used to mean. And so we have to look up things so that we get the meaning of the writer. Boasters. Exaggerate. Seeking your own advancement and agenda. Build yourself up in the eyes of others. Boasters. They exaggerate. They seek their own advancement and agenda. And they build themselves up in the eyes of others. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. We're in a world of, I mean, dog eat dog, step on who you must to do your agenda and to get your achievement. And, you know, we, we think, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> Look at them. <laughs> but what do you tell your kid to do to get the position on the ball team? I've been hard on ball teams lately. What, what do you do, what do you tell your child to do to be a part of that group? What do you tell your child to do? I mean, does getting A's get you in a certain thing? What, what are we teaching and what are we doing to promote ourselves that our children see that we're doing on the job to get the promotion? What are we doing on the job to get the attention of the boss? You remember what we said last week when we taught on favor? Let favor work. This goes against boasting. When we exaggerate and we try to make ourselves look better than we are, that's, that's boasting to get something, to we get something out of that. What we taught about last week was God's favor on our lives gets us far above anything that we could achieve on our own. And we studied Joseph. Let favor work. How are we seeking advancement? How do our children seek advancement? Are we promoting ourselves? It's tempting, and the reason it's tempting is because everybody else on the job is promoting themselves, so you think you have to promote yourself. Because if you don't, they're going to promote themselves, and they're going to get the attention, and they're going to get the job. Let favor work. That's just the teachers coming back. Let, let favor do its work. Don't enter into boasting. How many times in a conversation do we use the words, I, me, and mine? When we stop and listen to ourselves, we'll find how full of ourselves we are. All of us. All of us. I'm sorry this is so hard. Boasters. It's, it's a sign of the time. It's going to get worse. Number four, proud. You can see how these build on top of each other. Proud. This is superiority. And you know, when I taught this two years ago, I went back and listened to it. I was talking a lot about intellectuals and how intellectuals have sometimes tend to have a superiority complex. 
and, and I see this a lot against religion, like the intellectuals look down on those of us who choose to believe. But God really got me today when he brought to my attention how much superiority is in the church because we believe and they don't. How we tr we're, we're out here trying to prove them wrong because we have superior knowledge. Now it's okay to bring the truth, but how I bring the truth is very important. Why I bring the truth is very important. It's all about the atmosphere that we're setting. Because who wants this in their face? Nobody does. We don't want it from the intellectuals. I'm not saying because you're a Christian you're not intellectual. If intellect is your God, if intellect is your God, if science is your God, intellect is your God, knowledge is your God, and you do this to the poor little Christians who choose to believe, and we've got the Christians who think they're so tight with God that they're doing this to the intellectuals that don't believe, what good are we doing? What light are we? We've got to change how we do things. The method, we can't, we can't be proud. This is about us today. Not letting these characteristics in our home. Proverbs 29, 23 says, Arrogance will bring your downfall. But if you are humble, you will be respected. You know, people listen to people they respect. So if you have a point you want to get across to one of your friends that isn't saved, you don't do it by being disrespectful. First you build respect, then they listen. Then we get something done. We, we have a lot of people in our lives that aren't saved. But if we get cocky and proud and we start popping things off because, you know, so we know God, we're Christians, they're not, they're not listening. They're not listening. So we can't afford to get proud. Once again, how many times in a conversation do I say, I, me, and mine? Do you feel the need to prove you're right? Just look ahead and smile. I don't like to be wrong. Do I, babe? I'm never wrong what he would probably say. I am. Five or six percent of the time. I got that from the man on the front row that just turned 79 yesterday. If I feel the need to prove I'm right, I'm wrong in being right. I mean, the heart motivation, this all comes down to heart motivation. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your mind, with all your intellect, with everything you know, love the Lord you got, your God with it. Quit loving yourself with what you know and love God with what you know. And it'll change. Everything goes back to that first verse of Scripture that we read. How far will you go to prove you're right? How far will we go to prove our point? Will we, will we go to the, to the point of offense? Then what have we accomplished? I see a lot of people like to stir they like to stir, boy, during the political season. It was horrible. I was like, just don't, just don't type anything. Put a scripture. Nobody can argue with a script. Well, they can, but they can't argue well against a scripture. Why put something out there about politics just... I've got a friend that's really bad about this. Just put something out there just to watch the fight. Just put it out there and then just stand back and watch, watch the fight. What good have we done? None. We've offended people. We've shut them down even more. Respect comes to the humble. When we tell our children we're proud of them, what are we proud of? And, and you know, I always say this every time I teach on parenting. Are we just as proud of the way they handled the bad call as we are the run they brought in? What are we proud of when we say we're proud of our kids? That one can hit us all, can't it? Let's just move merrily on to number five. Let you ponder that one when you get home. Blasphemers. 
Now, everybody wants to think that that's blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. No, this, this word means corrupted speech, inappropriate, rude, crude, nothing sacred, nothing off limits, talk. It's blasphemy. Definitely a sign of the times that we're seeing. Nothing's off limit. Anything can be said. It's rude. It's crude. It's corrupted. It's inappropriate. And they don't care anymore. You know, used to when I was growing up back in the day, things that were off color were not allowed on television until after 9 o'clock. Any, anybody else? Okay, thank you. I mean, you would not see a Victoria, Victoria's Secret commercial at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? The children are watching television. But you know, who can sell pornography to them when they're 40 if they're not showing them half-dressed women at age 12? So they change it. And so now we, we have commercials on while our children, you can't walk away from the television. I don't even care if it's Disney, you can't walk away from, you cannot. I mean, Braden knows when these certain shows come on that are kids shows. Well, we try to keep him busy, you know, without watching television. We made it all weekend without watching television until I think he watched Thomas uh, for just a few minutes till he crashed. Not Thomas didn't crash. He's still good. He's still okay. <laughs> Braden crashed. Don't want to cause any panic out there. Times have changed. Times have changed. Rude, crude. It doesn't matter when they do it. It doesn't matter if it's a children's program. They're putting it out there. And we have to be careful. Braden will tell you, I can't watch that. I mean, you're already had, you're already got the remote control in your hand, but he knows his mama does not let him watch that. I can't watch that. Blah 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 is on. I can't watch that. He's three. Thank God for parents like that. Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, whatever I'm seeing, hearing, saying, is it acceptable in the sight of God? That's how I combat corrupted speech. What we put in is going to come out. Have you ever caught yourself singing a song in the grocery store? Or in a store, you know, and they've got the music playing? I mean, by the time they do the second round of it, Kayla, you're, you're singing it. You know, my favorite, tear in your beer. I mean, some of the dumbest songs are the most memorable. And you hear it, they're playing in stores. They're, we used to go to ropings all the time, back when Dad was roping. And you'd hear some of the most awful stuff. And before you know it, you're, you're letting corrupt, inappropriate, crude, and rude, nothing sacred, nothing off limits words. We've got to guard what's coming into our hearts if we're not going to be blasphemers. Because what we put in, it's going to come out. What music are you playing in your car when, when, when Breck is in the car seat? Oh, she doesn't understand it doesn't matter her brain is computing it I can I can start singing songs that my mother sang to me as a child they're torturous any <laughs> may I don't please uh, I'm a little junior miss I can hug and I can kiss I can sing and I can dance anybody know those oh and still they, they come to my mind. Torture. Look, they're kids, but it's computing. Their little minds are sharper than ours. They're made to absorb more at that age than ours are made to absorb at our age. And we think they can't understand. So what if they can't understand? At 15, when they've sang the song, that you didn't think they understood what those words meant. At 15, they're about to figure it out as soon as she gets in the car. Oh. 
We've got to be careful what we let in. What have we got comfortable talking about? What are our children comfortable hearing? What are our children now comfortable seeing that wouldn't have even been seen on a television when we were kids? And now we, we excuse it, we think nothing of it, we think we can tell them it's not right, and yet we're letting their minds get comfortable with it? We're letting our minds get comfortable with it? I mean, when we can't have a Disney movie without two gay characters, we're in trouble. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you think about it. It's inappropriate. Inappropriate for a 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, probably till they're 20 to where they can even think and know what it's talking about. They're getting comfortable with it. And we're paying them to watch it. How are our manners in our homes? Manners are tough. They're tough to teach. Right now we're just trying to get Braden to where it's not just no, it's no thank you. You know, oh that just sounds so good when you say no thank you. Even if we don't like the fact he said no, if he says no thank you, it's, it's a good moment. Because it's better than no. inappropriate, crude, rude speech. Let's clean it up all the way home. Let's speak with respect. Husband and wives speak respectfully to each other. Be respectful to each other. I, I know I, I've said this a lot of times, but there's not a meal I put in front of Rusty that he doesn't tell me thank you for. And it doesn't matter if that's a sandwich or, or if it's his favorite, fried deer meat, cooked in butter. Thank you. Well, you know what? Food doesn't just appear. Your children need to be thankful for it. We need to be thankful for it. We've, we've, we're retraining ourselves to bless our food even when we're out in public. And to thank God for it. We're always real good to do it when Braden's with us. Let's thank God for our food. Food doesn't just happen. So let's, let's be respectful. If we're respectful, we won't be blasphemers. I kind of got off there. But let's reinstate manners in our homes. I know the teachers would appreciate it. Bosses would appreciate it. Co-workers would appreciate it. If we reinstate manners. All right. Disobedient to parents. Number six. Disobedient to parents. Oh, Bob, would you like the mic? Youth pastor extraordinaire. No longer correctable. No parental authority. Control is now in the hands of the children. That's really the generation that we're seeing come up. Oh, but we don't want to. We don't want to qu uh, quench their spirit. You better quench it. Because it is not the spirit of God that's coming up in your kid. That's the spirit of the flesh. And if you don't quench that spirit of the flesh and teach them how to operate in the spirit of, go of good and godliness, then you're not going to like. And boy, we've seen this. People that, that want to let their children find their own God. And when they die, we can't comfort them. We've had, we had that happen last year. What do we even say? What do we even want to say to a parent who lost a child and the parents don't believe there is a God? What do you even say? I'm so sorry. And then you just pretty much walk away because there's nothing else you can say because they didn't want to quench his spirit. He should get to choose who you let him choose hell. No, we, we're going to have obedience in the household. This is a chain of command. When did we teach on chain of command? Authority. Wednesday night. We've been teaching on authority. And if you break God's chain of command, you lose the power. 
and authority and obedience is one of those great links to God. In, in, in being obedient to, teaching obedience to parents, we're teaching obedience to God. To disobey parents is to disobey God because he set the order. He made the command. And if we don't enforce that and we don't encourage that and we don't teach that, we are teaching our children to disobey God. It's hard to, it's hard, it's hard to discipline the little guys and girls. My goodness, they're cute. But you know, when they smart off at five, it might be funny. But when they smart off to the officer at age 16, it's probably not going to be. So if they don't obey their parents, we can forget them obeying anybody else. We can forget them respecting authority anywhere else. If they don't respect the people that gave them life, then we're in trouble. Children do not need to be in control. Ephesians 6, children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. This is the first authority they'll ever know. If we don't get this one right, we're in trouble. Teach honor by showing honor. Don't disrespect your kids and expect them to respect you. In our discipline, in our correction, in us asking them to obey, we can't do it wrong. We got to do it right. We got to do it for the right reasons. Never allow dishonor from you or from your children. It's not appropriate. Are we correctable? As adults, are we correctable? Because if we're not correctable, we're teaching our kids not to be correctable. Are my children correctable? These are important questions for us to answer if we don't want them to be a part of this generation. We want them to be set apart. All of these things add up. I mean, if you look at these, being, being disobedient to parents brings us to number seven, unthankful. We can't be without gratitude. This unthankful word means entitled. And I guess if you had to pick one word to fit this generation that we live in right now, it would be entitled. They think they have a right to things they do not have a right to. Do we still give thanks for our food? Do we thank each other? Is our home full of complaining? Then we're unthankful. Complaining is the opposite of thankful. Oh, man. That'll stop your mouth. My mouth. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Be a thankful generation. You'll be different. Be a thankful employee. You'll be different. Be a thankful student. You'll be different. You know, if, if we lived in the generation where girls could not go to school and girls could not be taught, we'd be thankful to go to school. If we lived in, in a society where only certain classes were educated, then we'd be thankful if we got to go to school. Unthankfulness is a sign of the end. Be ye thankful, the scripture says. Be thankful, and it'll make you different. Man, I'm almost out of time, aren't I? I am out of time. Five minutes. I think we better stop there. We'll start up next Sunday morning with unholy. And then we'll have ten more to go. I'll try to speed it up next week. Next Sunday, all right? Ponder on these uh, this week. Think on them. Look over your household. Don't try to, as my dad would say, don't jerk the wheel. You're not going to change all of this in one day. You're not going to go home and say, okay, kids, we're not complaining. We're not, you know, you're unthankful, you're unholy. You're Take an evaluation. Start making some steps in the right direction. Don't jerk the wheel. You'll throw everybody off the bus, okay?
Good? I can breathe now. We're through for today. On those. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. If you would like more teaching, you can visit our website at www.rccenter.org or download our app to your device. The Russellville Christian Center is located at 305 Lakefront Drive. If you would like to purchase a copy of this program or if you would like more information, please call 479-968-7965.